Welcome back into the studio, Lauren. Uh, thank you, great interview with Oren and with Colin, really appreciate that. And uh, again, great content, great information as this continues to roll. I, I'm just, I'm loving everything that's coming at us because a lot of this has to do with the variety, right? We've got all of these people streaming by in every direction. Everybody is looking for their own level of capability, the technology that they came to Barcelona to be able to find. And it uh, does my heart good to know that Cisco can provide them with uh, so much information. So again, every one of these videos every one of these segments that we do, it just expands the conversation that much further and we're glad that all of you are tuning in to be a part of it. Right now, we're going to continue the process. I've got a couple of new friends with me over here. I've got the <laughs> ladies here in the uh, live TV studio. Uh, Marisa Chancellor, Senior Director of Enterprise Security. Glad to have you with Thank us. You. Thank, you. Thank you. And then standing directly next to me, Josefina Fernandez, uh, Director of Information Technology. So thank you guys. Thanks for sure. the time. I know you guys are, are crazed here throughout the week, so I really appreciate the time in the studio. So what I want to do is talk about investing in architecture and operational excellence. If we are going to protect the enterprise, IT leaders, security practitioners, they are facing this just overwhelming challenge, right? As we try to secure the enterprise, we have got real threats coming at us out there. We've got perceived threats coming at us. We've got attacks that are always getting more sophisticated by the hour. Ah, it's crazy. All right, so let's talk about this from your perspective. We talked about this narrative this morning, right? Rowan brought it up. Security has to be at the core in the data of the DNA of any application. Yes. So let's talk about ransomware a little bit, right? Okay. Let's start with that, mm -hmm. ransomware as a service. Okay. These platforms, they're becoming the tactic of choice for bad guys who want to breach a company, and the reality is, it's working. Yeah. Yeah. We can't deny it, right? So why? Why do companies have such a hard time defending against these types of attacks? What do okay. you think? Mercy, do you want to kick it off? And Sure, I, I think there's a couple things, and, and you know, Cisco's not immune to this as well. We end up going through, uh, you know, with the WannaCry uh, outbreak last year. We're we just getting right to the heart of the matter. We're going to get well, WannaCry yeah, right away. I know, but you know, that's what uh, you know is happening all around the world yeah. to a lot of different companies. And I, I think what happened to a lot of companies is there's a couple things. One is that there's an operational excellence that needs to occur. So Cisco. I wouldn't call us lucky, I would call us prepared because there was a patch that was put out 50 days before it actually hit. And we were in the midst of deploying their patches to most of our systems, so we had a very low hit rate in our environment. But the second thing is, I mean, you think about our technology and how most of our customers have a lot of point solutions. They have, you know, the best of breed from this company, the best of breed from the other. Well, when you come to Cisco, not only do you have the best of breed, but it's best of breed and integrated. And so when you think about AMP or our anti-malware protection, uh, if it's on our email security appliances or our web security appliances, on our firewalls, they all communicate with each other. So if it sees something coming in one vector, it immediately talks to all the other systems and blocks it right away. And so, but, you know, unless you apply the patches, you yeah. know, you're not going to be effective. What so. do they say? Chance favors the prepared mind, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. And so I think what you heard from Marisa is, you know, I think we have a lot of operational rigor that we've put in place. Um, so that very much aligned to that operational excellence you um, you spoke out, spoke about up at the beginning. And so I think what, what it allowed us to do is, it's not like, you know, it happened and there was no work for us to do. Um, both our teams were actually <laughs> quite busy. Nice? Yeah, no, that would have been fantastic. Um, but, but we haven't gone to that point yet. Okay. Um, you know, automation is, is something that we continue to invest in, but, but you know, to say that we didn't have anything to do would, would not have been true. Mm -hmm. So we did, our, both our teams were busy. Um, you know, we had uh, you know, over 300 people from global teams involved. We had 1,000 man hours in the first five days. However, the impact from a resourcing perspective was to our teams. It yeah. wasn't to the business, it wasn't to our internal clients, and it wasn't to our customers. And so I think that is what really made the difference You know, where, where Cisco's concerned. Absolutely, and I, when we look out and we look across the industry and we see, well, what other companies would have that kind of ability to be on top of it from the beginning when it arrives and then be able to continue to handle it starting from moment one, the minute yeah. we recognize it. Most companies are in reaction mode, right? right. They're too yeah. busy staggering backwards and trying to keep themselves from falling, we're already on the tripod, we're already up and approaching. So for those companies, for those others out there who are just yeah. trying to figure it out, what do we say to them? How do we get them on board with working with us to make sure that they are protected moving ahead? Yeah. Right. You know, I, I think it, it has to do with coming up with their own playbook, right? Mm -hmm. So so they need to understand what does their threat landscape look like, right? And, and we talk about a, a playbook that we use at Cisco, we think about, you know, who would attack you? How would they do it? 
why would they do it, when would they do it. You need to, to understand what your threat landscape is to understand where you're most vulnerable because the reality is none of us have infinite security budgets. I mean, mm -hmm. we'd love to we'd think love we to. do. <laughs> sure, sure, whatever. And, and we'd, it would make our job a lot easier. All right, but... fine, I'll pitch you a few extra bucks. Fine, <laughs> I get it. But the reality <laughs> is that it, it is finite. And so you need to know where you're going to place your bets because no, all of the... Uh, no area is going to be equivalent from a vulnerability perspective. There are some areas where if they attack you, they can do so much more damage than, than somewhere else. So it really comes back to understanding what your threat landscape looks like and then seeing how, how do you set up that integrated architecture and that sort of um, yeah. uh, defense in depth to, to be able to be prepared. And that's about visibility, right? So if we totally. talk about, I mean, we just came out of the, <laughs> at the Innovation yeah. Showcase, we talk about uh, Tetration, right? Yeah. These are all these abilities that give you that view so that you have that wide angle view. You're not hunting around for information. It's all available to us. Totally. I would say the network is your friend because mm. if you cannot see what's on your network or in your environment or you overlook it, you can't defend. No. And that's those big gaping holes. And I think a lot of companies do the right things, but maybe their scope, that, that what they look at is quite narrow. Right. And so you have to be saying, you have to be thinking outside of, you know, the enterprise or outside of this particular area because you know we are finding all these stuff in our labs, in our extranet partners, and it's those simple things about the IoT device that's sitting, the thermostat someplace, or the light bulb somewhere that is like, oh I didn't consider that part of my network. Well guess what? That's an avenue in. And so that visibility is absolutely key and, and finding out what those tools are to give you that visibility, but also having the mindset to say, I'm always scanning, looking around, mm. trying to see what's out there, because that's the only way you can then start to anticipate, um, and because if it's day zero, it's too late. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's start to take some action on all of this, right? Um, I've heard both of you talk before about the need to invest more heavily in security architecture yes. and in uh, architecture principles. Why is that level of investment, that type of investment, so imperative in addressing today's attacks? Mm -hmm, right. Well, I think, um, first of all, we have to acknowledge that uh, the world is changing, right? Even Cisco, and, and we talk a little bit about this in, in the section that we're going to do in the ITM program. So even Cisco, we had to look back at, at our architecture, the architecture that we had put in place in 2007, and realize that it was not going to allow us to scale for what was coming now in 2017, right? And in these 10 years, the world has changed a great deal. Um, you know, I even think about sometimes when I studied computer science <laughs> in, in, in college, right? And you, you could talk to anyone, you didn't have to, on the internet, you didn't have to worry that, oh, you know, they might, not. you know, want something else. And so, so the landscape has changed. The, the attack vectors have increased dramatically. And, and, you know, when you think about things like identity, right? Identity is another thing that has changed, right? That, that identity perimeter has changed, especially with that movement to the cloud, cloud. right? So, so I was cloud, just going to yeah. say, the bigger the cloud, the more your exposure. Exactly, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got new concerns around data privacy, right? We have GDPR coming into place in May of 2018. Right now, we're, we use all these devices, these IoT devices that contain privacy information that if it got into the wrong hands. So, so much has changed that, that it forces you to have to sort of, you know, update that architecture and, and come up with something that is going to scale for these continuing threats. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. And, and our attackers are essentially using a lot of the same architecture as well. And so we, you know, in the, in the past in security, we thought, oh, it's those, uh, maybe call, we call them kitty scripters who are out there trying to, just for pride, get into your environment. Nowadays, it's an entire supply chain of attackers. And so it's a business to them, and the things that they do uh, to optimize their business are the same things that we're doing to optimize our business. They're trying to be more efficient, they're going to the cloud, they're doing code reuse, they're doing all these things. And so when we think about what we're trying to do, we have to be one step ahead to say, ah, where might they be pivoting in terms of a business and uh, focus it on in that way. Sure, you know what, let's take a step backwards for just a moment. Let's talk about architecture in terms of layers of security, right? Okay. Stacking them up as layers so that they all work with one another to support what's underneath them and create the strong foundation 
innovation. Right. What's the best way to describe that in the simplest possible manner? <laughs> um, the simplest yeah. manner. Uh, so yeah. So that somebody walks up and they say, well, what do you mean architecture of security? What do you mean, what do you right. mean architecting? Well, I mean, I, I think it has to do with, uh, you know, covering all the layers that you have, right? From, from the, the network all the way to your endpoints, right? And, and so for us, it's looking at how are we protecting each of those layers? And, and some of it is leveraging, you know, uh, security that, that we had in the past, right? So, you know, we had email security before, we, we still use that now. We still need to have antivirus, um, you know, on our endpoints, but, but it's so much more than that, right? Now we need AMP, you know, as an example, advanced malware protection for, for the endpoint. Because, why? Because nowadays, it's so easy for, you know, your common user, you get an, an email and with a nice link and, you know, everyone's got like click frenzy, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone <laughs> likes to click on things and the next thing you know, you know, you think you're going to get a free $10 Starbucks card and the reality is somebody's just dumped some malware Absolutely. into your um, into your computer, right? So, so that's the thing is that, again, because those attack vectors have changed, uh, we, we need to look at, at every each of the layers, you know, starting from the network all the way up to the endpoint to make sure that each layer is protected. And, and that's kind of what we refer to when we talk about uh, defense in depth. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I would say the other part of it is not just thinking about this as a technology stack. The other part of it is, you know, in our world, in IT and in, in information security, we're all about how do we enable the business but to do it securely. And so one of the things that we also work on from an architecture perspective is the business architecture. Yeah. How do you embed security mm -hmm. into the business of what they're trying to do? If you're thinking quote to cash or idea to product, what are the things that you can be doing to embed security early, not as a bolt-on at the very end, mm -hmm. and that has to be part of the business language as much as the technology language. And that's a really good point, Marisa, that I want to hit on, because in the past, we always look at security and IT kind of working in silos. Yeah. They didn't <laughs> trust each other, they didn't want to talk yeah. to each other. Those days are, not only are they past us, they're now long past us, but yeah. for a lot of organizations that have been around for years, yeah. they still function in that old methodology. Yes. Yeah. We don't throw out what we had before, how do we get them to communicate and tie together Together in the best possible way. Right, right. Um, well, you know, what I can uh, say from my side is, again, um, I'm responsible for infrastructure security, and I can tell you that I partner very closely with Marisa. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, you guys are a perfect living, yes. breathing example standing <laughs> but, right in front of me. But these. to your point, actually, um, so we've come up with these metrics that we use to measure our services, right? And, and you know, we have our infrastructure services, but then there are services across the rest of the, the business areas. And so what we do is we actually have security readouts on a quarterly basis where we look at what does the security posture for every service looks like? And that's not my responsibility. My responsibility is to create the forum where we come together and share this information. The service owner ultimately is the person responsible for the security posture of their service. Yeah. And that is across all of IT. Does that mean they have to step up and take that authority though? They, they, well, not only authority, but they're being held accountable. Yes. Wow. So coming from the top, uh, this is where top down uh, also helps, you know, from the CEO expectation, from the board expectation, uh, from the CIO expectation. And luckily we have some very competitive VP, VPs, so they don't yes. want to be lowest man on the totem pole there. Sure. Um, but on the other hand, you, we talked about the business as well, and, and you know, Josephine and I always like to joke, it's like, well, security is everyone's <laughs> responsibility, but when you ask the question, they kind of point back to us. Uh, yeah. And, and we, we started to change the language a bit, which is, when we talk to engineering, it's like, you know, you're responsible for deploying and creating trustworthy products because we don't want our products going out to our customers in a way that is immediately compromisable or doesn't meet the security standards. And when you say the word trust, they go, oh, I get it. In the manufacturing world, it's like, oh, you're accountable for ensuring a trustworthy supply chain. Nobody can inject some things into our products that we don't want it to happen. And you think about when Kelly is reporting out to the board and, and, and whatnot, those are the, you know, how do you have a trustworthy finance model? And so when you inject the words trust, also comes along the responsibility or accountability for that. And I found that really has helped change language. And when I talk to customers about that, that's probably the one thing they always write down, trust, 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 trust. trust. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, and that's something that people can figure out today as well. This is by having you guys in the room, by having the rest of the security team here in the room, they can come up and, and establish that trust, just ask your question. Mm -hmm. We're going to answer it honestly, we're going yep. to tell you what's available to you. Yeah. Take advantage of everybody being here in this space. I wish we could spend another, I mean, <laughs> we'd easily fill another 40 minutes together. Yeah. Um, Marisa Josefina, thank you guys. Thanks for Wonderful. being here in the studio. Great insights, um, interesting, and again, a good welcome. This is the call to action. Come and make it happen, put it together, start right here in Barcelona. So, great. Well, thank, thank you. Really appreciate it. It's been Thanks great to talk to you us. about.